it is such a privilege to be with you again. Uh, wow, I come to MPAC to learn, and um, I got quite an education today. I hope that this opened up my opened up my thinking. I hope it uh, opened up everybody in this room. Um, Faisal and Salam asked me to address you because Salam made the mistake of putting me on a Zoom call with the Impact Advisory Council, and we had this marvelous set of presentations on the Impact programs. I mean, it, it, it was just all of the service programs that you have, and all of the new programs that are doing outreach to women, and I mean, they were just wonderful programs. And I weighed in at the end, and I said, that's all very nice, but, but it's beside the point of where we are right now. And they wanted me to kind of recapture that, how I blew up that meeting. Because I have been in a lot of meetings with African American pastors and leaders, with my uh, uh, Hispanic brothers and sisters in a lot of meetings, um, you know, LGBTQ. I've been across the spectrum of the folks who believe in a pluralistic e pluribus unum multiracial, pluralistic, multi-religious democracy, and those who, in the words of our poet, national poet, Amanda Gorman, said the forces that would shatter rather than share the democracy. And I always say, as a lawyer, there's, there's something called an order of proof. You have to put the evidence in an order. You have to know what to argue first, right? or the judge and the jury are not going to be, understand whether you've satisfied all of the elements of the, 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 the right that you're trying to vindicate or the crime that you're trying to prosecute. There's also something analogous in politics, and it's knowing what frame we're in. I call it the order of battle. Now, Dr. Hatut said, Connie, you're a warrior. You use militaristic language too much. <laughs> We are a peaceful religion. <laughs> You're always coming in. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm too old for therapy. You know. <laughs> Even in, I mean, I'm, I'm a litigator, which is a warrior with paper, right? I go into court, right? I'm a Christian. And then in my spare time, I did Taekwondo. There is clearly <laughs> something wrong with me, OK? But I am way too old. I always have my eye on what's the fight. What frame are we in? I love to talk about programs. I love to talk about service, direct service. But ladies and gentlemen, we are in a unique inflection point in American history. We've been here before. But here's how we know that we're in an existential frame. And when we're in an existential frame, we don't have the luxury of indulging our individual groups particular lenses, perspectives, and outlooks. We have to band together. And I was with some African American uh, pastors who, I, I said, I'm not asking you to endorse or live or subscribe to the LGBT community. But if they are under attack, we are next. I don't have to agree with every tenet of every religion, every ideology, every lifestyle. I don't have to subscribe to it or agree with it. I hope we can get back to the day we can have those battles to fight about policy, to fight about statutes, to fight about values. I wish we were in that frame. I wish we were in a policy debate. We are not. We are not. How do you know? Because when it's a clash of values, that was 1968. It was a clash over the Vietnam War. It was a clash of values. It was a culture clash. Uh, 1933, there was another inflection point in this country. That was a clash over economics. But 1860 was a clash over the fundamental identity, the fundamental uh, feelings about truth and fact and fundamental disagreements about power. And right now we're in a battle with a shared power vision, which is what I think this community is about, 
what my different communities are about, and I've got about 15 of them. I am the great granddaughter of slaves and slave owners. We have Congolese, we have, we have Russian, we have Ashkenazi, we have, I have a UN for a family, okay? <laughs> I can't indulge, I don't, I can't afford to hate anybody because they're in my family, all right? And we've got Muslim, Jewish, Christian, atheist, you name it, we've got it. One transgender member, I, it is the, the human tapestry in my family. We don't have the luxury, okay? I have so many tribes, but no one of them is more important than preserving the democratic framework so that all of us can be free and have liberty. This is the existential fight that we are in. So we have to create what Martin Luther King Jr. called the Grand Alliance. The Grand Alliance. We can oppose each other later and bicker and fight later, but right now we have to save democracy because why would the great granddaughter of slaves care about a system that enshrined her bondage, her ancestors' bondage? Why? Because the American democratic framework is the, is, is the only governmental framework that has built into it perfectibility of the union. We correct our flaws and we march forward to progress and enlarge the liberty, equality, and the promise of this country that this conference says is a sacred honor to achieve. That is what we are fighting for. And I, I will share with you a story a year before an assassin's bullet felled him, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was at Harry Belafonte's beautiful South End Manhattan apartment. I've had the privilege of being there many times. It's like a museum to human liberty, liberation movements. <laughs> and it, it, Martin Luther King Jr. had just come from a very dispiriting confrontation with very young African Americans who were with the Black Power Movement. And they didn't want to do peace. They didn't want to do nonviolent protest. They didn't want to do the sort of Christian values of, of, of br trying, to, trying to persuade through love, trying to demonstrate justice and make the moral case for the country so that the shame the country into ending apartheid, into ending Jim Crow, into allowing African Americans the vote and just the right to live. He had led that battle for the country. The country was coming around. But young folks were like, you're taking too long. We want a power movement. And he came back to Harry Belafonte's apartment and he was very dispirited. And Harry said, what's wrong, Martin? And Dr. King said, Harry, I fear we are fighting to integrate into a burning house. And Harry said, then what is it that we must do? And Dr. King said, we must become firemen. We must fight to save this country from itself. We must fight to realize America, to force America to live up to her ideals and to extend it to all of the human beings who live in this great country. We must become firefighters and ladies and gentlemen, it's no longer a house on fire. We're talking about mega fires now. We're gonna to have to become smoke jumpers. We're gonna to have to get those planes and start dropping that orange stuff on stuff. We are going to have to create an army to fight for this multiracial pluralistic democracy. E pluribus unum is our greatest credo. It is in the seal, the American seal. Those words of the many one, not of the one one, of the many one, many religions, many races, many orientations, lifestyles, many value systems. But we are one under a pluralistic freedom, liberty, dem democratic vision. Let's unite even with the folks we don't like, okay? I'm not asking you to like folks or is We have to join because divided we will perish. If there is a white 
nationalist, patriarchal, Christian nationalist frame on this country that is getting power in order to deny everybody else who is not like them power, we're done. The democracy is over. And ladies and gentlemen, you and I will be on the boxcars to Manzanar too. Because we cannot allow genocidal, annihilative visions of you don't belong and you should not exist. That is what that vision is. No, we are e pluribus unum Americans. And we are going to achieve this democracy and the vision of this country. And we are going to perfect this union. We have to join together. We need a battle plan on several fronts, short term, medium, and long term. Short term is next week. We could lose this democracy. It's not 2024. The Democrats are always five years too late and a million dollars too short. I'm not, I'm not a member of any party. My cousin, I'm calling her up because, you know, it's Condoleezza. I'm like, where are you? You know, get out there and get your people in line. But bottom line, if, if we don't understand the frame that we are in and the battle that we are in. So short term right now is galvanizing for, to vote for people who believe in actual democracy are not trying to end it for everybody. Medium term is the 2024, but it's not just about elections. It is about reaching out to the people who were so whipped into a frenzy of hatred, they believe that we are trying to kill them. If I believed what they've been told, if I believed what they've been told, I would think of us as an enemy too. They have been deprived of jobs. They have been deprived of it. They've been left in a rust belt. They feel like they're looked down on. They're cut out. They're not on television. They're, they're, they're the butts of joke, uh, jokes on television. Their cultures and their dances and, their, and their, their, their entire way of living. They got rid one, one, one of the taxi drivers told me in Appalachia, he said, you erased us. We're not even on television anymore. So stepping into that empathetic shoe. If I were in their shoes and I were whipped into a frenzy with lies, lie, path, then liaria, there's a new disease. It's an epidemic, okay? Yeah, yeah, there's, there's democracidal liaria going on, and the big lie will kill everybody, okay? What we have to understand is if we can't persuade, not everybody is unpersuadable, but we have to let them know we don't look down. We do want to include them. I am worried about poor white coal miners who have nothing but black lung disease, and then Medicaid is cut out from under them. We have to care about them too and tell them we are not out to exclude or annihilate them. We want them to be part of that tapestry. The call to action, let's get, they're going to call for a constitutional uh, 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 convention, but they want to get rid of a freedom constitution. We need to be ready with a constitution that actually talks about fundamental rights. The first, right to, the first human right is not the right to speech, it is the right to safety. The first freedom is not the freedom to associate. It is freedom from violence. We can write a constitution that builds in what the doctors in this panel were talking about, the right to shelter, the right to access to health care, the right to, sh the, the right, simply the right to achieve who you were meant to be, whom God meant you to be. All of those liberties. We could rewrite the Constitution, but we cannot let people who don't want us at the table. I tell people, there's nothing more American than being owned by America. I am the descendant of slaves and slave owners. My ancestors died to have me stand here. Join them in a continuing fight for our freedom and for democracy. Thank you. Thank you.